see that sign up here? Up here? Yeah. DEFCON? That indicates our current defense condition. It should read uh, DEFCON 5, which means peace. It's still on a four because of that little stunt you pulled. Actually, if we hadn't caught it in time, it might have gone to DEFCON 1. You know what that means, David? No, what does that mean? World War III. That was Matthew Broderick and Dabney Coleman in a scene from John Badham's 1983 film, War Games. Hello, and welcome to episode 116 of the Occasional Film Podcast, the occasional companion podcast to the Fast Cheap Movie Thoughts blog. I'm the blog's editor, John Gaspard. In today's episode, I chat with director John Badham about three of the more than a dozen features he's directed in a long and distinguished career. After spending a few years in television, directing hours and hours of episodic TV and made-for-TV movies, Badham broke into features in 1976 with the Bingo Long Traveling All-Stars and Motor Kings. He followed that with Saturday Night Fever and other box office hits like Stakeout, War Games, Dracula, Short Circuit, and more. His two filmmaking books, John Badham on Directing, and I'll Be in My Trailer, The Creative Wars Between Directors and Actors, are both excellent go-to guides for anyone interested in learning the ins and outs of how movies really get made. In addition to ebook and paperback versions, both books are also available in audiobook, and both books are highly recommended. But before you run off to buy both books, here's the interview. So thank you for talking to me. I I could talk about every single movie you've done, but I'm not going to do that. I have focused myself to take principles from the two books, both of which I love, and take some of those principles and see how you applied them in different situations on three different movies. So just to get some background to make sure I've got the history right, your first TV directing gig was on The Bold Ones, right? The Senator? Yes, yes, that's right. And then your first TV movie was The Impatient Heart. Right, right, yeah. Okay, so I'm just doing some rough figuring, and before you shot Bingo Long, which was your first theatrical feature, you did somewhere between 35 and 50 hours of TV. You had a lot of stuff under your belt before you tackled that theatrical feature because of you've all the series you did and the made-for-TV movies. So you were pretty well learned by that point for that first feature. How did that help you on that first one? Well, it certainly helped you learn how to prepare things, what you needed to do, and working with actors, getting attuned to working with actors. The mechanical parts of it are fairly easy to learn. Right. The the cameras and lenses, the microphones and the lighting and, and stuff like that. I feel very comfortable just from my years at the Yale Drama School working in theater where you're doing somewhat analogous things along the way. And then as I was working my way toward directing, once I came to California and was working at Universal, I was able to sneak down to people's sets and meet directors and and kind of hang out with them and found an interesting approach because I've Initially, going and hanging out on a set sounds like a lot of fun, and it's good for about 10 minutes, and then it is just boring as hell. Yeah. And I realized, I don't want to, this is boring, what, what could I do better? And then it came to me, the truck, the truck just ran over the director, and I have to do it. What am I going to do? Mm-hmm. So I would, get hold of, I would get hold of the script and, and try and prepare the day's work roughly and then come down and be able to watch what what the director was doing. Mm-hmm. And it didn't matter who was right or wrong. What it did matter was because I had thought it out. Yeah. I had a basis on which to judge, you know, was it a good idea they were doing? What stuff would I have forgotten? I just, just learned by watching that that way. And so after four or five years of doing television, I was pretty pretty well versed in a lot of high speed, quick filmmaking for episodic television in particular. But so then do- the movies of the week, you know, were a nice step in between. Mm-hmm. There you, you had a chance, you're still working quickly, but not nearly at the silly lightning pace 
of the episodic. So was the speed at which the features were shot, was that easy to ease into? Or were you always just thinking, why is, why is it going so slowly? Why aren't we going faster? Why, 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 why? why? Well, yeah, it seemed to me on, on Bingo Long, where they said, well, we're going to shoot this in 38 days. And I thought, 38 days? What am I going to do in the afternoon? That, oh, my God. I can go home after lunch. We'll get this. Well, little did I know how long camera would take and baseball games to shoot and stuff like that. And the production manager kept telling me, it's going to be 52 days. And I said, no, no, we promised 38 that we would do 38. I'm going to do it. No, it's it's going to be 52. Of course, he was right. It was 52 yeah. right yeah. on the money. Yeah. He, he, he knew it. So I just had to re-gear my brain. Same thing on Saturday Night Fever. Same 38 to 52 days. You know, just me getting to understand what that next level up of filmmaking requires. And and in terms of the, the detail of the filmmaking and the careful performances and things like that. When you look back on, on the hours and hours and hours of you know, on the job training you had before that first feature. And then you think about directors starting out today who simply don't have that. Getting all that experience is hugely helpful. And I know you've taught for years. And what advice do you have for someone who's diving into a feature for the first time who doesn't have 40 hours, 50 hours of finished TV work under their belt? They're in a lot of trouble. <laughs> that's what I, That's what the truth is. It's so much harder than it looks. And I see that with my students, you know, with the filmmaking that they come up with. It's, it's, it's really difficult to learn it. And the thing that turned out to be really good in, in, in my case and some other friends of mine is that we got a lot of practice and learned how to, how if we stubbed our toe, it was not the end of the world that you could, you could get through it because it is harder than it, than it looks. And, and they've, they've got a great harsh awakening Mm -hmm. coming for them. You know, I've, I've worked with several cameramen who've become directors and of that several, almost all of them never did it again. They, it drove them crazy. And they, and they were brilliant cameramen. You know, these mm -hmm. were top of the line, the best guys in the world said, Oh my God, we're going to get a so-and-so to, to direct this. And they hated it because you had to deal with actors. Yeah. And, and that was, that was, they they were used to a crew that would just jump if you, they said jump and you know how high 10 feet they they jump 10 feet but the actors are going what they didn't like that that's your special gift i think you know you can direct action like nobody's business but when it comes to getting an actor where you need them to be i mean you straddle both sides really really nicely and to talk about that more specifically i do want to talk about isn't it shocking I don't know why I know it as well as I did. It must have aired at least twice when it came out. And that's around 1973. Right. Um, yes. I know that I was a big Harold and Maude fan. So I wanted to see Ruth Gordon in something. Oh, um, good. Yes. But I was really taken by it. And it stayed with me for years and years. And I found it recently on YouTube. You can see the whole thing on YouTube. Not a terrible print of it. And some some questions came up first. One of the first credits on it says David Shire did the music. How did that happen? I was at Yale when David was there. Okay. And worked on two musicals that he and his partner, Richard Maltby, wrote. And so we were friends from there. And I was, you know, excited to be able to bring on a composer. I think it was the first one that he had ever done, the first film he had ever done. I mean, he might have done some low budget things, but my recollection is that he had been playing the piano for the Fantastics off Broadway forever and ever. Mm -hmm. That was his day job. How did Isn't It Shocking come to you? I think I think my, my agent at the time was able to talk two very young producers in into taking a look at work that I did, which which was at that point, I think the impatient heart was probably what they, they might have looked at that at that point. Yeah. And it was just a wonderful script. You know, it's just laugh out loud reading and so much fun to do. And we shot it really quickly, like in 12 days up you, in Mount Angel, Oregon. The casting of it is is so terrific. You know, besides Ruth Gordon, you've got Will Gear, you got Alan Alda, you got Louise Lasser, you have Lloyd Nolan. Does 
I know you you kind of started out in casting and you've consistently had really smart casting on all the movies. Do you remember how that cast came together? Well, my producers were New York based and they had a great sensibility for actors so that somebody like Louise Lasser, who I didn't know at all, Will Gear, I certainly knew, and Lloyd Nolan I had worked with. Alan Alda was, you know, we all admired his work and thought we were really lucky to get him right at the end of the MASH season. Yeah, it looks like and, it was right at the end of the first year of MASH. Right. And and we were shooting on the lot at Fox where MASH shot any, anyway. So I was able to go over and, and visit with him and talk with him and get to know him. Mm -hmm. But as I, as I say, my producers were very helpful because they were just into, into every detail. They were over, over my shoulder, breathing down my neck in the middle of close-ups. You know, <laughs> we, need, we need more goop on them. We need, this is not goopy. <laughs> this is not goopy enough. They goop is very me. important in that movie. That you need enough goop because it, yes. it gets bad when he runs out of the goop. It drove me a little bit crazy. And at one point, as they're whispering in my ear during a take, I call cut. I reach for my wallet, pulled out my director's kill card and said, here, you fucking do it. <laughs> oh, boy. You know, this is at least two or three years before Mary Hartman. So right, at that point, right. Louise Lasser is from Bananas. And, a couple of Woody Allen movies. Yeah, a couple of Woody Allen movies, but not that famous. It felt to me like this could have been a backdoor pilot, that if MASH didn't go, here we have these two wonderful characters of Louise Lasser and Alan Alda solving crimes every week with, not that Ruth Gordon wanted to do a TV series, but it would have been a fun way to continue those characters because they were, they were really charming together. They were wonderful. And we forgot about Eddie O'Brien. Oh, exactly. He looks so upset in that movie. It's hard to watch him sometimes. I had seen him in a pilot that Jack Lord was starring in. And he played a bad guy and he had these thick Coke bottle glasses on. Mm -hmm. And and he was quite a quite a treat. He was quite a handful because he wasn't always very focused. Right. And sometimes getting him off. Okay, that's that shot. Now we're going to focus on this shot. And he's still back in the uh, earlier shot. Well, you were juggling so many different kinds of acting styles. And I'm just, that's one of the, the things that I want to talk about from the book is when you have in, in one scene an Alan Alda, Louise Lasser, and a Lloyd Nolan, I'm guessing their acting styles were a little different or their approaches were a little different. How do you juggle different techniques when you need to get everybody on the same page pretty quickly? It's a real challenge to do that because you have some people that like to rehearse a lot and some people that don't like to rehearse very much at all. Some people that are good on take one mm -hmm. and other people who don't start to get good till four or five. And you're going to find every single time you're always going to run up against these disparate characters. If they haven't worked together a lot, you're now trying to massage, you know, am mm -hmm. I going to shoot Will Gear first in this scene or am I going to wait because he gets better later on? And if I shoot over his shoulder, he's kind of warming up. So when I'm ready to turn around onto him, he's at that good cooking point. Mm -hmm. He's simmered, you know, he's done. Yeah. You can stick a fork in him and it's be all right. That's invaluable knowledge to have when it comes to planning out your day and your setups. Oh, yeah. I mean, once you start to get a fix on how the people like to like to work. I learned once from, from Jodie Foster. I worked with her when she was very young and we were kind of become friends. And I was asking her how she likes to work with actors. She said, the first thing I do is I go up and I ask them how they like to work. Mm -hmm. You know, do you like notes? from the director. Do you like to go first? Do you want me to let you move and find your own blocking? How, how do you? And just kind of having these conversations lets you know a ton of stuff. Elia Kazan talks about it all the time in his, his book saying, actors will tell you anything. You just met them and they'll tell you their entire life story uh, in, a, in a few minutes. And, and you can learn so much about how their acting style is just from the stories that they tell and their perspective on the world and you're so smart to be able to go and have dinner with them a couple of times to sit with them and just not talk about the business but just their life and understand you know what you may be able to get from them that that's so smart just that idea of well just ask them ask them what you, you don't have to pretend to know everything. And that's one of the things you keep coming back to in both books is don't pretend to know everything ask ask 
And yeah. that's so smart yeah. to just ask them the way they want to do it. You know, this is sort of connected. A friend of mine is one of the editors, was one of the editors on Veep. And he said it took them a little while in that show to realize that, you know, most things are shot. You do a master and then a close up and a close up and a close up. And he said, it doesn't work on an improv show. You have to oh, do God, all your yeah. close ups first until everyone's sort of settled into what they're going to do. And then you do the master at the end because that'll match. He said, you do a master up front. It's not going to match anything you're doing. Wow. And it's, it's, you know, it's like, well, duh, obviously, but we're so attuned to this idea. Well, you know, you start out and then you move in and move in. Right. And they, they just turned it on its head and went, no, it's got to go the other way or the master is just useless. Right. Well, those are outrageously funny. Yeah. So speaking of improv, you mentioned, I think in one of the books, one of my favorite Ruth Gordon stories. I was lucky enough to meet her when she came through town here in Minneapolis. Harold and Maude played for two and a half years oh when, God. I, when I was a teenager. And I got to meet her and Bud Court and hang out with them a little bit during that time. And in one of the books, you talk about where she came up to you and said, this line isn't working for me. Right. And you said something along the lines of, well, just, you know, say what you want. And do you remember what her response was? Oh, yes, absolutely. I said, well, Ruth, what would what would you say? And she looked me right in the eye, kind of waggled her finger and said, oh, no, I get paid for that. <laughs> yeah. And she went ahead and said the line as written. Yeah. The one that she started out complaining about. A couple more things on Isn't It Shocking. There's one point in it where Alan Alda is walking through, I believe it's Ruth Gordon's home. And you did, for that movie, a pretty long, continuous shot. Now, you said you shot in, was it 12 days? Right. How risky did you think it was? It doesn't look, maybe you did do coverage on it. We just didn't see it. But when it comes down to setting up shots like that, what are you weighing in your mind when it comes to how much time I have and what I need to get done today and continuous shots versus a lot of coverage? Well, you know, usually the continuous shots you can get several bits of coverage in the shot itself. Mm -hmm. And so if you write down the amount of time it takes to do a continuous moving master versus a lot of separate shots, it works out to about the same. Okay. It's just a different, a different way. And in that particular shot, if I remember it right, we pick up Alan Alda coming in the front door. Yep. And then as he's walking through, there are, cats hanging everywhere mm -hmm. and cats dropping down out of the ceiling yep. onto him. And you can see them hanging on light fixtures. They're all over the place. And I remember our production manager had an arm full of kittens and he's walking behind the camera, putting them up in these, all of these, these places. And, and you could see them kind of hanging on by their front paws or whatever. It was very funny. It's a delightful movie. It was crafted in such a way that at least it seemed to me like you had very cleverly gone, well, I can get named people because they're only going to be here for a couple days. It's not a big deal. You know, I only need Will Gear for a few days if you're shooting right. it that way. I only need Ruth Gordon for a couple days. I only need Lloyd Nolan for a couple days. So it's kind of fun for them, but it's not a huge commitment. Right. And I think a lot of filmmakers don't think that through when it comes to, you might be able, if you're making a low budget, no budget movie, you might be able to get somebody to come in for very little if they like the script and if it's only going to take a couple days. If they're going to be sitting around for three weeks, well, that's a whole different consideration. But if they can have fun for a couple days, that's just a really smart way to write it, I think. Yeah, it was nice. It, it was easy to get, get to because we fly them up to Salem, Oregon. Mm -hmm. I think everybody was from L.A. I forget where Ruth Gordon was coming from, but that was not bad. And it's a very pleasant area there in Oregon. It's The air is just fabulous compared to L.A. air, yeah. especially at that time. And, you know, it's just re really pleasant. Well, if you haven't seen it for a while, it is on YouTube. Give Great. it a look. And I think I, I, I you, will. Sh you should talk to the producers about getting it out on Blu-ray and you should do a commentary on it. It's a just a little lost gem. Okay, mm -hmm. enough on that. We'll move on now to probably my favorite John Badham movie, and that's War Games. What I was surprised to learn was that you came into the movie when it was already up and running. Some stuff had already been shot, right? Yes. Yeah, they had shot for maybe a week and a half. I'm I'm guessing. Okay. And that was Marty Brest who'd started it and then went away? Right, right. Yes. Okay. Another terrific director with Midnight Run being one of the best comedies 
maybe of all time. So what do you do in a case like that when they say, you know, the phone rings and they say this movie's up and running, get up to speed as quick as you can. What does that mean? How quickly can you get up to speed? Well, my agent calls me and says, there's a picture that they would like you to take over. And I don't think you should do it. Why is that? Well, it's always when they're in trouble and they have to replace the director, there's going to be real trouble there in River City. Yeah. So stay away. I said, but what if it's any good? And and he said, well, I, I don't know. I said, well, I think we should read it. So I read it and I said, this is really wonderful. And I go in to meet with Paula Weinstein, who was running UA at that time. And after we talked for a while, she said, when, when could you start shooting on this? And it was about two in the afternoon. I said, I can walk over there and start shooting right now. And she went, what? I said, the trouble is it won't be any good. She said, why not? I said, because I barely read the script. I need a time to, you know, kind of absorb it and get my head wrapped around the thing. I think it's a wonderful script and, and I could do it, but the shots I would be doing would be pretty generic. And that's not what you want. You need something, you know, that is not as dark as Marty was bringing. Because mm-hmm. I had, I did have a chance to look at the dailies that he had shot and who was watching the scene where Matthew Broderick first takes Ali Sheedy up to his bedroom and shows her how he can change her grade on the computer. And I'm looking at this scene and I kind of think the actors are good. I don't know who these kids are. The photography is wonderful. What's the problem here? Why is it not working? And then it came to me, they're not having any fun. If I could change a girl's grade on the computer and I was that age, 15, 16, I would be peeing in my pants with yeah. excitement. Yeah. You know, I would not be treating it like we we're 60s, you know, rebels on the, on the dark web. If there had been such a thing at the time, it's not that at all. It's it's a kid who's into into games and playing. So that was the first thing that I, I reshot was I took them right back to that bedroom on the stage. And it took us, oh my gosh, several takes before we could even get them warmed up because Matthew and Allie figured that they were going to get fired any minute too. Right. So they were terrified of me. And as we kept doing takes, I would just run in there and tell jokes and tickle them and do anything to make it. This is light and breezy and we can have fun. And so around take 12 or 13, I'd never do that many takes, but I figured I don't, I can't turn in dailies that look only a little bit better. Yeah. They've got to be a hundred percent better for the studio to have gone to all this trouble. So I, I said to them, I said, okay, we're going to have a little break here. We're going to take 10 minutes for coffee, Matthew and Allie. You and I are going to have a race around the outside of the stage. And we'll we'll race around here. And the last person back has to sing a song for the crew. That was going to be you, I wasn't knew it? who that person was. You know, I'm, yeah. I'm like 20 years older than them already at that point. I know who's going to lose. And as we get back to the stage, of course, I'm last. And I remember this old song that we used to sing in Glee Club in high school called The Happy Wanderer where a guy yodels and that just kind of helped break the ice and loosen them up so that they started to get more playful with it. How did the bit of business where she traps him between her legs come about? Was that a rehearsal thing? Was that you? Was that them? Oh, I think it was something Allie just did. Okay. Yeah, I know. It was, it was very, very erotic and in its own little way. And his reaction is great too, because he doesn't know what to do. Yeah, yeah. He did. <laughs> what? That's right. I, I forgot, uh, totally forgot about that, but I do remember it happening. You know, if in a parallel universe, I'd be interested in seeing what a finished War Games by Martin Brest would look like, but I'm glad we got your version because I think that's the one that's more of a crowd pleaser. By the time you were pulled in, was the NORAD set already designed and built? Yeah, pretty much built. They were already shooting tests in there to see how to how to sell the thing the best. Mm-hmm. And Billy Fraker, the cinematographer, and myself went over there and spent a lot of time walking around saying, you know, how, how would we shoot this? You know, how was I thinking about shooting it versus whatever Marty had in mind? Right. Was well, all the casting done at that point? Was Dabney Coleman already cast and John Wood? Dabney Coleman was cast, John Wood. I recast 
Matthew's father. Okay. I didn't care for the father they had. And and I recast the general okay. who they had was okay, but they needed a bigger personality. Right. The visuals on the Crystal Palace set on those screens, were those already in production when you came on? Because there's a lot going on on those screens and that's all happening live while you're doing it, right? Those are, yeah. this is this is not today, this is back then. And and everything that happens, happens right in front of the camera. Were those all yeah. ready to go when you came on or were you part of getting that ready? Because there's, a, there's so much stuff going on in those screens. This movie, as far as that concern, was brilliantly prepared. I mean, they were creating film that would take you several minutes per frame in the optical printer to create. And that had been going on for quite a long time because they, they had six front projectors, four rear projectors, and 82 video monitors. But all, all of these hundred and whatever had to work in sync with each other, which had never been done before. Nobody had ever tried to gang that much equipment together to run and the hollywood family that did this for years the hansards you know were able to solve solve the problem so you had all these projectors running in sync and you could photograph from any angle which you know you maybe might have trouble doing if you're doing blue screen you know it used to be with front projection rear projection you didn't want to move the camera Right, Because you didn't want to get off the hot spot of the arc light. You know, if you got off to the side, it would fade out. But the film had gotten a lot faster. And Fraker was just the best yeah. at making all this stuff go together. The sequence at the end when everything's blowing up, you get so much bang for your editing buck. And you're shooting it all live. That's what just kills me. I mean, nowadays, they would just, okay, we'll deal with all that in post. But you had to go into the edit suite with all those shots of all those screens doing all those different things for that last big whopper explosion thing. For the time, it's really incredible. Well, I much prefer it that way. You know, Jim Cameron in the, in the latest film of Avatar, he's managed to get it. So what he sees through the camera is what you're going to see on the screen. He's not waiting for stuff to come back from some horrendously tedious project. And so we were doing a much cruder version of that than what Jim was able to accomplish. But it's, you know exactly what you've got at that time. And you're not suddenly stuck with bad exposures and nasty looking bad blue screen work. Right. That's the balance that I think is so amazing in your career is great performances, highly entertaining stories. But my goodness, the action and getting all the pieces you need, just an education in itself. John Wood, I'm a huge fan of John Wood. He wasn't in enough movies. What was it like working with him? This was an absolute lovely English pro of the first order. You know, English actors are so disciplined and, and so together compared to our American actors who tend to be a little loosey-goosey. Yeah. So I had somebody who was just totally focused on doing the best job that he possibly could. And he was so humble, maybe falsely humble. I used to think that. But he would come up and say, oh, dear boy, I'm ruining your movie. And I'd say, oh, John, that's bullshit. Just shut up. You're doing great. It's, it's just, just lovely. And he was at that point just starting rehearsal for Amadeus to play the Salieri part mm -hmm. on the road. And he was asking me, he said, they've got us on a raked stage for this, which is fine. He said, but my back is killing me. I can't be on this raked stage with the high heeled shoes of the period. Yeah. And I sent him to my chiropractor in Culver City, and he came down to where they were rehearsing and managed to completely solve his back problem with different kinds of shoes and stuff like that. That's so John was just, you know. So grateful for that because he was miserable. In War Games, he is the center of one of my favorite shots of yours in the war room when he first enters and he comes down the stairs and crosses the entire room. Look, I don't have time for a conversation right now. General, are you prepared to destroy the enemy? You bet you. Do you think they know that? I believe we've made that clear enough. Then don't. Tell the president to write out the attack. 
Do you remember how you did that shot? Oh yeah, well we did it with a with a crane that mm -hmm. that was designed to work inside and was one of the first cranes that would extend out and pull back through the space that he that he was going through. Was that because the was that the Luma the, crane? Yes, it was. Thank you. I remember that from remember. Polanski's Tenant film. He he had it where it snaked up through a stairway. But it's such I mean, a it, lovely it would, shot. It, it it did work out really nicely. The war room was stepped up. As you went toward the back of it, it went up, you know, four or five steps. So it wasn't a matter of being able to dolly straight back. Right. Yeah. Because you couldn't you couldn't do that. But the Luma crane was better than your average Chapman crane because it had this extender on it. The mechanics of it were very difficult, however, and it slowed you down to a crawl because it took so long to get it set up, rigged and, and right. right. And now there's better equipment. So I'm sure nobody except Mr. Luma uses it anymore. But at, but uh, at the time, it was... Um, oh, it's it great. An audience member watching the movie is unconsciously aware of the fact that this room has steps and goes up because you've seen people coming down the steps and going up the steps right. even to the stairs on the side but i mean the room is just tiered and so when you see john would come down the stairs cross the room and go up and up and up and the cameras with him the whole time you mentally go how are they following him they're going up steps and it's not steady cam because i don't think steady cam came about till maybe the next was it even there then steady cam was around since 74 Anyway, it's just a fabulous shot. Two more things on War Games. The opening scene with the, the two guys who are in the bunker is such a great tension scene. It's beautifully staged, but it also sets up the theme of the movie so perfectly. Was that always the opening of the script? As long as I worked on it, okay, it was always the opening. Did you and make any changes or go back to previous drafts when you came on board? Or were you just... I, I did. Okay, I did. I, uh, I I asked them to send me every draft that they that they had, and they had taken the original writers Lasker and Parks, and had replaced them with a couple of other other writers, and they had changed the script quite quite a bit. And I went back and read Lasker and Parks, and said, "This is the one that we need." I'm throwing these other ones out. And, and I, I called the guys up and I said, come back, help me out here. You know, we can tidy up the script the way the way you like it, the way it should be. Yeah. So we were able to do to do that and to, to fine tune it to where I, th I think it was doing the right thing, doing the best job. OK, one more War Games question. In, in the I'll Be My Trailer book and in both books, you talk about being totally honest with actors, but you are occasionally willing to keep them in the dark, or I wouldn't say trick them, but not necessarily tell them everything is going to happen just to see what they do. And the example in War Games is when Matthew Broderick tussles Dabney Coleman's hair after his hair has been tussled by Dabney Coleman. I believe that, that was something you told Matthew to do, but you didn't tell Dabney. How often does that come up? And how often should you use that sort of technique of surprising people on camera? Well, I think it can be fun. You get a, a spontaneous reaction Mm -hmm. from them and if it works that's great if not you've always got what was scripted right and sometimes you just get an idea watching it for example the Dabney Coleman Matthew Broderick example that you give they had to kind of shake hands or hug or whatever in the excitement of it and and Dabney you know rubs rubs Matthew's hair in the rehearsal and so I went over and told Matthew on the quiet hey you do it to him you know to surprise him because Dabney, Dabney has a temper and he kind of reacts. And I, I knew he was not going to just take it lying down. And yet he's, he's like, you know, six or eight inches taller than Matthew. Yeah. So what are you going to do? Are you going to hit the kid? It's a lovely moment. And what I love about that ending of War Games is that when the movie's over, it ends. You don't drag stuff out. The movie's no. over and we're done. And I wish more films did that. Is that just a built-in barometer with you that you just know when it's time to just put up the end? To get out. I mean, I, I hate watching movies where you just have one ending after another and you got to wrap up every single character. And I understand why people do that, but it just bores me silly. And that's probably coming from working in television where they always have to have at the end of an episode, an epilogue, you know, we've convicted the murderer, we've gotten the bad guy, 
you know, and then they go to commercial and they can come back and they have a two minute scene. And usually it's just deadly stuff. Yeah. There's nothing much fun about it. I did a lot of episodes of Supernatural and they had hit on a formula that actually worked great, which was you went to commercial when you came back, you'd always have a scene with the two brothers that was sort of off topic from what the rest of the thing had been. Mm -hmm. And it was just great fun. And you, you hung in there to watch it because it was a delightful addition. It was not some, you know, millstone hung around the series neck. It's not literally filler where you're trying to fill those two minutes. You've actually come up with something yeah. fun. Do you have a couple more minutes just to talk about Dracula very quickly? Yeah, let's do let's do that. What a great version of, of Dracula. I believe in one of the two books, one of the things you said was, don't be afraid to say, I don't know, let's figure it out. And I got the sense you did that a lot on Dracula. There was a lot of, how do we do this? I don't know, let's figure it out. And you had some of the best people. One of them I want to ask about is working with Albert Whitlock and Matt Paintings, which are beautiful in that movie. And of course, seamless because his stuff was seamless. I should know how this is done. I don't. Is he painting the painting and you're bringing it live to the location and setting it in front of the camera with the part open that you need for the live thing? Or is, is that all placed on in post? The old fashioned way to do it is... You would set a frame up in front of the camera. Mm -hmm. And now let's say you're extending a building up. So you would literally stand there and paint it on the spot. Okay. That was the first way that they did it. So that when you shot the film, you had a combined matte painting. Yeah. It was all together as one piece. Albert, what he did was he would block off in black all the parts where he's going to paint and oh. just leave open the parts that we were going to photograph okay, and make it so that none of that black part was exposed to anything. He would make you put down a platform that was rigid. It would take an earthquake to move because nothing could move. Everything had right. to be absolutely stone rigid. Yep. And you would shoot two or three takes of whatever it was. The castle, Dracula's castle was one that we did, you know, several of. And now take that film back to his studio and put it in the refrigerator. Do not develop it. Now he would go in and clip off a few frames from the unexposed negative and develop that and now create a mat where he painted in everything. And he could now take the original film out of the refrigerator and he would run that through the camera again, not exposing the part that had already been exposed, but now just exposing the top. And, and so it was all original negative. That was his whole feeling. He was not working with dupe negative yeah, at all. That's why and, it looks so great. And it's absolutely perfect. Mm -hmm. By that point in England, the guys had kind of tried to go beyond that and figuring with new film stocks, they could make dupe negatives. Albert only gave us 10 shots and other ones that we had were done in a newer style where they didn't have original negative and th they don't look as good as what he did. One last question about actors, because you had a great example in Dracula of dealing with an actor who was sort of playing with you to get more time on camera. And that was Donald Pleasance and his bag of candy. Um, <laughs> at what point did you realize that he was doing that? And what advice do you give to someone who has an actor who play in games to be on camera. When you realize what's going going on, you have to decide how you how are you going to deal with this. I had a similar situation with James Woods in a movie called The Hard Way, mm -hmm. and he's the same kind of same kind of guy exactly. Always looking to kind of sneak more time on camera, how to upstage other people. And Donald is the you know is the genius at upstaging other people, and I would just call him on it and say, Donald, let's give Lord Olivier his close-up here. Let's give Larry his close-up. I never called him Lord Olivier. <laughs> if you called Olivier, Lord Olivier, he'd say, Larry, dear boy, Larry. Thanks to John Batham for taking the time to chat with me about those three key movies. As I mentioned in the introduction, his books, John Badham on directing, and I'll Be In My Trailer, The Creative Wars Between Directors and Actors, are both excellent and are highly recommended. 
Did you enjoy this interview? You can find lots more just like it on the Fast Cheap Movie Thoughts blog. Check out the link in the show notes. Plus, more interviews can be found in my books, Fast, Cheap, and Under Control, Lessons Learned from the Greatest Low-Budget Movies of All Time, and its companion book of interviews with screenwriters called Fast, Cheap, and Written That Way. Both books can be found on Amazon and anywhere you get ebooks, paperbacks, and audiobooks. And while you're out there, check out my mystery series of novels about magician Eli Marks and the scrapes he gets into. The entire series, starting with the ambitious card, can be found on Amazon in paperback, hardcover, ebook, and audiobook formats. And if you haven't done it already, check out the podcast companion to those books, Behind the Page, the Eli Marks Podcast, available wherever you get your podcasts. Well, that's it for episode 116 of the Occasional Film Podcast, which was produced at Grass Lake Studios. Original music composed and performed by Andy Morantz. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you occasionally.